to start this morning with a, with a question, um, and not a rhetorical one. So I'm asking for some feedback a bit here. Sometimes we buy knockoffs. Everybody with me on that term? On purpose. Why? <laughs> Everybody, one, two, three. Cheaper. Cheaper. Okay, less expensive. What's that? There was... There, okay. Well, so what you're saying is there is a difference between less expensive and cheaper. Yeah. Sometimes, um, so there's, a, there's an intentionality about that. Um, sometimes we buy knockoffs and we're unaware. Anybody? Yeah. So when we lived in Varna, Bulgaria... Um, we, uh, and we were there for a couple years before we moved to Poland, but the downtown area of Varna is beautiful. And particularly during the summer months, people would come from everywhere to Varna, Bul Bulgaria. The, the Black Sea is right there in front of you. Literally, there are, there's uh, Roman ruins right at the edge of the sea. There's a bunch of things you can go see. It's a beautiful, touristy area. And it is knockoff land <laughs> and uh, and people buy them and a lot of times they buy them unaware what is it that makes us think when we go to a touristy place well this has got to be the real thing even though I got it for a tenth the price uh, honestly I'm not sure what gets us to think that that's uh, uh, that's going to be true I, I bought this uh, this item and, uh, and they told me, right, they told me it's a fill-in-the-blank uh, representation. What are some of the items? When I, when I, start, uh, when I start us down this, this, uh, this lane, what are some of the knockoff things that you're kind of familiar to, to you? They, they kind of jump to your mind as items that people buy that are knockoffs. Purses. Watch his shoes. Yes, yes. Okay, so I actually looked this up. Um, these were the top four things, at least. Uh, and, and I looked at several different sites, and, and they all kind of relate. They were in different order on different sites. But these were the uh, four top luxury items that are most often counterfeited. Okay? And some of you, you hit most of these things. Chanel perfume, Ray-Ban sunglasses, Rolex watches, and, and then they gave a list of several different purses and bags and different makes, and you guys hit on a lot of those. So here's a question I have for you now, and this is, this is of the rhetorical kind as we segue here a little bit. What are things that you are willing to invest time and money focus into and you definitely do not want to knock off? Okay. People, relationships, Politicians. Good luck. So we're not talking about purses and watches and belts and perfumes now, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of look at this in some broader terms even than what you mentioned, I think, and just say uh, love, hope. Acceptance, peace. We, we want to feel like if we're going to invest love and time and energy into a relationship, and we want for the umbrella over that to be a true love relationship, we, we don't want to go X amount of time 
invested and find out that it's not a true relationship of that kind. And yet I'm looking across our group <laughs> and I'm thinking that virtually everyone here, except for maybe some of our younger folks, maybe, have invested into a relationship that they hoped was going to be the real love. And it didn't end up in some fashion or it broke apart. Amen? I came upon this beautiful poem uh, a couple weeks ago, I think it was. It's um, written by Mario de Andrade, um, a Brazilian poet, novelist, essayist who passed away in 1945. It might have rhymed in Portuguese. It doesn't in English, but it's still beautiful, I think. He wrote these words. He says, I counted my years and realized that I have less time to live by than I have lived so far. I feel like a child who won a pack of candies. And at first he ate them with pleasure, but when he realized that there was little left, he began to taste them intensely. I have no time for endless meetings where the statutes, rules, procedures, and internal regulations are discussed, knowing that nothing will be done. I no longer have the patience to stand. <laughs> this is a pretty straightforward statement. Absurd people who, despite their chronological age, have not grown up. My time is too short. I want the essence. My spirit is in a hurry. I do not have much candy in the package anymore. I want to live next to humans, very realistic people who know how to laugh at their mistakes and who are not inflated by their own triumphs and who take responsibility for their actions. In this way, human dignity is defended and we live in truth and honesty. It is the essentials that make life useful. I want to surround myself with people who know how to touch the hearts of those whom hard strokes of life have learned to grow with sweet touches of the soul. Yes, I'm in a hurry. I'm in a hurry to live with the intensity that only maturity can give. I do not intend to waste any of my remaining desserts. I am sure they will be exquisite, much more than those eaten so far. My goal is to reach the end satisfied and at peace with my loved ones and my conscience. We have two lives, and the second one begins when you realize you have only one. So I ask you again, how much time, money, effort do you want to, pu to put in pursuit of knockoffs? Isaiah 55, 2, if you have a Bible with you, um, you can open that up. We're going to spend our whole time here, at, at least we're going to refer back and forth. Isaiah 55, verse 2. I think we have that uh, behind us. Let's stand together. It's just a short segment of scripture, but let's stand together and read this. You ready? Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. Lord, Bring us your spirit in a way that makes this idea exactly what you intended to say to us in these words. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. The first half of that scripture, the message version, 
uh, translates it this way. Why do you spend your money on junk food? Your hard-earned cash on cotton candy. A few quick notes, and then we're going to get to some principles here in just a second. But a few quick notes just about the, the wording that is here. Uh, there is a word in, in Hebrew that you attach to another word and it turns it into the negative. Um, so that what we get in this scripture we just looked at in Isaiah, it comes out like this. Um, there's the word for satisfy and by attaching this other word to it, it comes out like satisfy not. Right? Or what is bread? Not. We're kind of familiar with that concept. Uh, in Swahili, and, and, and I've shared this, I think, a time or two before, I, but I remember, if I say kuna, what does that mean? Okay, if I say hakuna, there is not, right? There is not. So we get, there's a song that we've sung before here, hakuna mungu kamawewe, there is no God like you. Hakuna pendo kama wako. There is no, what? Love like yours. Or hakuna roho kama wako. There is no spirit like yours. So it's the same kind of concept. And when I'm reading this, and these are the words of, of the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in Isaiah. Not satisfy, not bread. It's as like, it, it, to me, when I'm reading this, it's like there is this inner dialogue that is going on. And, and it's between me, or at least God is asking me to have this inner dialogue. Between me and the Holy Spirit in me. You with me? Anybody have that dialogue periodically? <laughs> sometimes it's fun, sometimes not so much. Yeah, I was thinking about that in, our, in the class we just came out of and, and the, the dialogue um, about the Holy Spirit nudging us. I'm going to put this, this is free. This wasn't in the notes anywhere, even mine. I think that the Holy Spirit speaks to us all the time. Even those of us who have not asked Christ to be our Savior yet. He's speaking. I also think that the voice of the Holy Spirit is typically more encouraging than we think. Some of us are locked in a space where we've maybe come to think that, that the only words he speaks into our lives are, are negative and criticisms. And I just want to say, if that's what you're hearing Man, I want to pray with you because I don't believe that the scripture says that is his common speech. He will challenge us. Amen? He will challenge us a lot. Amen? <laughs> but the way he goes about it is, is encouragement. Questions. Allowing for us to work through whatever it is that he's wanting for us to work through. But it's not a voice of condemnation. If you're hearing that, it's somebody standing beside you that's not him most of the time. Or the voice of the one who hates to see us move forward. All he knows how to do is condemn. So in this inner dialogue that I feel like we're, we're being encouraged to pay attention to here in Isaiah 55, it's as though we're going, we're going in the flesh. And, and I can talk to you about this whole concept later if you have questions. But we're going, hmm, does that satisfy? And the voice of the Spirit is speaking to us in a, word, in a way that we can hear. And, and it's saying, don't think so. Is that really bread? And again, that dialogue. Don't think so. 
And that's such a huge understanding for us in this life, to begin to, to move toward things like the Brazilian poet outlined, to say, I, I, I want to spend my time on these things that are solid, these things that are meaningful. And, and, in a, and I could almost stop the message right here. I'm not going to, but... Uh, But that whole understanding of those things comes to us through the presence of the Spirit and through the life of Christ. Jesus is all about what lasts, what is meaningful. So here's three principles from that that scripture, and I'm going to move through these as quick as I can. The first concept is this, and these are in your outline. There is often a contrast of perspectives between me and the me I want to be. It goes back to this concept over here, belong, believe, become. If if I have in my mind this idea that I, I want to be as close to the me that he created me to be, there's a part of me (laughs) that wants to move away from that. Not necessarily understanding everything there, but just, again, the flesh and the spirit. There is a part of me that wants something else than what's good for me. I know that in my very best moments, I'm capable of hearing God's voice guiding me at home, at play, um, at work. And I know that because of his spirit in me, I'm capable of representing him well. Amen? In my best moments. I also know in my worst moments I'm not even going to finish that sentence. I also know some things I'm capable of in my worst moments. Operating outside of his spirit. And you do too. It's in this, uh, it's in this same chapter that Isaiah writes these words. This is again uh, from the mouth of the Lord. He says to us, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Verse 9, and as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And again, it's showing this disparity between the me and the perspective that I have that is just Ev doing his thing, and the perspective, the me that I want to become through the expression of the Holy Spirit in me. In case you're wondering, some of you who are checking boxes, if there's anybody here, this is a sanctification message. If you don't know what sanctification is, that's another conversation. But King David writes some similar ideas in the Psalms, and then Solomon in Ecclesiastes 2. Listen to the intense frustration that he's experiencing. This very wise man, very wealthy man. Ecclesiastes 2. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? And then in another verse, and this one might even be more frustration, just pouring out of him. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun and all of them are meaningless at chasing after the wind. See, that is that channel of pursuance of things. I'm just going to say, if we go back to the beginning here, that honestly are knockoffs. And he had, <laughs> he had warehouses full of knockoffs. All the stuff Paul continuously in the New Testament talks about his experience outside of the Spirit, which is not pretty. 
and then his experiences in the Spirit. So here's the second principle. Sometimes he, the Lord, the Spirit, Christ, has to tell me twice in order for me to understand. <laughs> yeah, one amen. Anybody else? I wish that wasn't the case, right? I so wish that, that God could speak to me just once, and I would go, amen, and move, and act, and think in line with his spirit. Notice, though, that in that text that we read just a few moments ago in Isaiah, the statement from God is recorded this way. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me. It's in there twice. It wasn't a typo. It's repeated with purpose. The uh, again, the, the rest of that verse, listen, listen to me and eat what is good. The Hebrew word for listen is shema. And I went back to, to make sure that that wasn't just an English translation uh, mistake. But shema is there twice. So it goes all the way back to the original writing. It's repeated. And the, and the translation or the definition of that word listen is, and maybe this helps us, Listen doesn't just mean turn an ear or take in the sound. The definition that was, was there when I looked it up is to hear intelligently. That leaves me out of the picture lots of times. And then this was attached to it here too. To, to hear intelligently with implication of attention and obedience. Oh, As I said, I, don't, I know that there's times I don't always hear intelligently. And obedience, I don't even want to talk about that part. Next principle. In my obedience, I get the whole thing that he intended for me. If we listen and live in obedience... Here's the promise, the tail end of that scripture portion that we just read. And you will delight in the richest affair. It's interesting that, so in English it just says and you, but if you go back again to the Hebrew, it doesn't just say you. It, it's uh, the word there is nephesh, and it actually means your soul will delight. In the richest affair, something deeper will be satisfied. Something deeper in you will have eaten what really is bread. Not just a knockoff, not just part of, of the whole, not just something temporary. You know, Jesus doesn't focus a whole bunch on the temporary. You read through the New Testament. He, he seems to always see the, the, the long run. Paul talks about that too. This is not a sprint, right? And so the words that are spoken into us in the New Testament uh, from Christ, from Paul, from all of the writers, really, they're focused on the long game. Making meaning of the present but understanding the long-term implications of what is happening. And ask for the worship team to go ahead and come to the platform. We're going to give an opportunity here in just a little bit for people who, in any capacity of your life, you want to focus your spirit, your heart, your mind on what is eternal, what is not a knockoff? Maybe you've been hurt, as I said, relationally with something. Or maybe it's another aspect of your life, but you feel like you've only got part of what 
God wants to give you. There is a professor of religion and philosophy at Hong Kong Baptist University. His name is Dominic Marbanian. Well, first let me give you this. This is the Oxford Dictionary definition for temporary. Lasting for only a limited period of time, not permanent. So Professor Marbanian listed 12 qualities of the eternal. So if we can align temporary with the knockoff and align e eternal with the real thing. So these are the 12 qualities. And, and if you're interested, he has scripture references that go with each of these. And I'm not going to read them to you because it will take quite a bit of time. But I can share this with you. 12 qualities of that which is eternal. It is unrivaled, unique, and exclusive. Number two, it is supernatural, not this worldly. Number three, it is imperishable and incorruptible. Number four, it is invaluable and precious. Number five, it is immortal. Number six, it is without beginning or end. Number seven, it is measureless and abundant. Number eight, it is fully satisfying. Number nine, it is invincible and unconquerable. Number 10, it is spiritual. Number 11, it is illuminated and enlightened. Number 12, it is fruitful. The knockoffs are not those things. So I'm making a leap. We're moving away from perfume and shoes and belts and bags and watches. Raise your hand if you've pursued something that was in this figurative understanding. You have spent time in your life pursuing something that has been a knockoff. Yeah. He wants to enact a work in us and through us that is eternal. And all of those qualities that I just mentioned are a part of that. It begins with Jesus. Jesus, we, we say it all the time, the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. He represents the beginning point for moving away from anything that has been a knockoff in your life. Let's stand. I'm going to come back in just, a, in just a moment and read a couple scriptures. But as we sing together, you, you do not have to come and kneel at the altar. I know for some of us, it's more comfortable to stand. But kneeling is fine too. It gets you closer to the Kleenex. together for nearly 12 years. If I could if I could offer anything to anybody whether this is so you've been here all 12 years or the last 12 minutes. You've never been in this space before. If I could share anything with you. It would be the eternal peace, grace, love, hope, and every other attribute of Jesus that the scripture tells us he has free to give to you. And so as we sing, 
if that's something that you would like to experience more of in a part of your life or over top your whole life today, I just ask you to come forward and take an, an action step of faith, believing that not, I mean, I'll come and pray with you, but what I believe even more strongly is that Christ will meet you at the point of your need, whatever it would be.